I'm your host, Bethany Moore, NCIA's Deputy Director of Communications. This month, we're sharing even more important news about the MORE Act, analysis of the results of the 2020 election, plus our own Board of Directors election results, and a new policy report from NCIA's Policy Council. But first, let's review some clips from the educational panels from our very first cyber edition of our Cannabis Business Summit and Expo. Before we review some clips, we want to take a moment to congratulate our new incoming NCIA board members to take their seats in 2021. Becky Collette from Collexium, Shayun Adedeji of Elevate Cannabis, Kimberly Cargyle of A Therapeutic Alternative, and Cody Strauss of Northern Emeralds. Incumbent board members Chris Crane and Taylor West were also selected to serve another term on the board. Congratulations to the incoming members and thanks to everyone who applied for a seat this year. And now for the big news. This morning, the House of Representatives voted 228 to 164 in favor of the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, the MORE Act, which would make cannabis legal at the federal level and work to repair the social and personal harms caused by federal marijuana enforcement. This is the first time marijuana was made, since marijuana was made illegal, that either chamber of Congress has held a floor vote on much less approved a bill to make the substance legal again. Overall, this bill is a huge step in the right direction and we'll be coming back to you next week with a full analysis and breakdown of the bill and what's to come with our Deputy Director of Government Relations, Michelle Rudder Freeberg. So stay tuned for next week. In case you missed it, don't worry, it's still happening. Our annual Cannabis Business Summit has moved from the expo floor to cyberspace. While the three-day live cyber event is over, you can still access over 150 hours of the summit's content and connect with our vendors until December 10th. Don't miss the unmatched access to the cannabis industry's leading experts, latest research, and most innovative products and services to help your business succeed. The website to learn more is CannabisBusinessSummit.com. Conversation topics ranged from cultivation, processing and retail, to policy and advocacy, business and investor services. Our CEO, Aaron Smith, delivered his annual State of Cannabis Address, unpacking the steady progress for cannabis throughout 2020, from cannabis being declared essential in nearly every place it could be during a pandemic, to the upcoming MORE Act vote that happened this morning, and what the Biden-Harris administration could mean for cannabis. The environmental impact of our emerging industry is top of mind these days, and Jake Mitchell, president of Sustainabus, presented on the importance of collecting and tracking industry impact data. Uh, why should you even be bother tracking your data? Like, why is it important to a cannabis company to track their environmental data and really all their data overall? Um, it creates a better understanding of your operations. Um, environmental data is operational data. It's, it's a breakdown of your inputs and outputs. So what you put into the system um, and what's coming out of your system on the other end and, and how that all kind of works together can only be formed with a basis of um, recording your environmental data. Um, it externalizes your costs so you can understand like what your waste costs are, your energy costs, um, and all the kind of leakages throughout the operation of how you're kind of just losing money in places um, due to your environmental um, resource usage and how it, it uh, affects you on the back end, like paying for waste pickup and things like that. Um, it also puts into the perspective long-term and short-term changes to your operations, right? So how, um, how your long-term investments kind of work over time and your short-term investments and 
how those affect your operations, right? How they affect it on the back end. If you have that back end data, you know how changes on the front are going to change that whole system. Um, it allows you to produce stronger production coefficients and investment data. So you can show um, your investors and show uh, your CEO or other operational influencers on your business how um, your data affects uh, the rest of your business, right? So it shows how your water outputs and your energy usage affects uh, your entire business and affects the cost of your business and then allows you to find, figure out ways to address those issues. Um, it reveals holes and issues within your production stream and life cycle, issues you might not have seen before without looking at your data and looking at how uh, your operation is working as a whole, right? If you're seeing this huge spike in energy that you don't know what it's from, tracking your data is going to allow you to open up that hole and reveal it for what it is. Um, it gives employees a better understanding of operations, right? It shows your grower how much water they're using, how much electricity they're using, and how they might be able to mitigate it. And it also shows your CEO where those costs are going. Um, and then finally, if we can all gather enough data, it helps the entire industry thrive, right? And gain insight into business operations, um, how the cannabis industry as a whole is operating, and what kind of factors we need to address. Um, you know, without data, you can't make good policy decisions, and we need that data in order to show us um, what needs to be addressed or what regulations we can get rid of, because there really isn't any data to support um, having a policy. Former presidential candidate, business leader, and all-around great guy, Andrew Yang, joined us with Politico cannabis reporter, Natalie Fertig, guiding a conversation on the future of cannabis, universal basic income, and a ton more. It was a live session and still only available at the Cyber Summit, CannabisBusinessSummit.com. As more states legalize adult use cannabis and the conversation starts to better include restorative justice, and social equity initiatives in the process, NCIA's Tahir Johnson was joined by Shonda Macias, Kinshasa Taylor, Kevin Ford, and Hope Wiseman for a very informative conversation on the opportunities for historically Black colleges and universities in the cannabis industry. On this, right, as um, you know, HBCU alums, you know, what, what, what type of role do you think HBCUs can play in like extending that, um, you know, that legacy and us trying to um, make sure that people that are alums and students can be active about, you know, getting opportunities in this emerging industry? Um, so I think that one, I mean, I think it's so awesome what. Uh, Southern University has done. Um, they're leading the charge and I hope that other HBCUs follow suit because what I found is that uh, quite a few of them are afraid to touch it. Um, and, and I understand, you know, a lot of people are, they receive federal funding sometimes and they feel as though it conflicts. So I think first, you know, we, people like us, people like uh, Dr. Macias and all of us are, are leading the charge in helping HBCUs understand how they can be involved and all the different ways that they can give back. So, um, I mean, we've seen, I know Morehouse has done, has allowed some cannabis uh, um, kind of education to happen. Um, I, we're, I'm not seeing as much of like recruitment or anything like that. And we can work with them a little bit better to be a part of um, their recruitment fairs and things like that. I think these are how we're gonna bring opportunities directly to the people. And then also, um, this is kind of separate, but a lot of HBCUs have a deep history in agriculture. So I think if we push, especially hemp, um, you know, opportunities with HBCUs and pair them together, that could be a great pipeline, um, not only into the hemp and CBD industry, but into cannabis, um, allowing people to have real uh, hands-on experience growing the plant uh, through a university. So, and, and Kevin, how about you? What what type of opportunities do you think there are for HBCUs and our alums and students to get involved in the industry? Uh, so, I mean, in terms of I guess what role do they play? I'm, I think it's more so on the on the stigma side. Uh, educated folks, and I think religious religious folks and Black folks in particular are some of the main drivers that are holding us back from advancing cannabis. And I think a lot of that educational standpoint comes and starts at HBCUs where we can tell 
our students and <clears throat> and alumni that you know cannabis is not what it used to be it's not what you think it was or thought it was and you really need to educate yourself on not only just what the plant does but the economic opportunities uh, that come along with the cannabis industry um, but I mean, I mean as far as hbcu graduates and students we all have an array of talents array of uh of, of expertise a, a variety of thought processes and there is really opportunity anywhere within this industry for you. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what the industry entails, but um, we just have to insert ourselves. And, and that's really the main point. Don't forget to subscribe to Tahir's podcast, The Cannabis Diversity Report today for more conversations about equity in the industry. His conversations are always relevant and at the forefront of the movement. You'll definitely hear more about Howard too. He loves his alma mater. As opportunities grow in the industry, we took a lot, took a lot of looking at the multi-state growth in depth and a look at business plans and operating models in a COVID world. Tom Zuber and Joe Caltabiano were joined by Jesse Channon and Joe Bayern for the multi-state operator roundtable. In, in our representations outside the cannabis industry, working with iconic companies, uh, there, there's a distinct difference as compared to the cannabis industry in the sense that you don't really see this vertical integration so much, right? So you don't see, for instance, Coca-Cola owning the Kroger's, right? Owning the Ralph's, owning the, the shop rights and so forth and, and so on and, and, and so on. Even uh, so as an example, when Apple launched their stores, it was new and it was exciting because it was different and worked out sensationally well that precise, uh, the, the, if you will, almost anal retentive control of the user experience from, from one point and in, in, uh, one end until the other end. Where do, how do you think this is going to play out in Canvas? Do you think that uh, there's going to be a mixture where you're going to have folks that own the experience from end to end and that's going to endure? Um, or do you think people are, that, that the, vertical, uh, uh, the vertical integration is going to give way to, to brands that are actually focusing on, on one aspect or, or, or two aspects of the of the, of, of the vertical as opposed to all of them. How do you think that's gonna play out? Let's say over a course of five, six, seven years, longer term. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in real quick and, and I'll keep it brief. I'm, I in no way claim to be the expert of making predictions with regards to that sort of model. But uh, for me, when I look at a window like five years, I actually don't see it changing that significantly versus what we see today. Um, I think that there are, I think Apple's a good example. I think you see this a lot with uh, microbreweries, you know, down in Atlanta, they have a, a great brewery, Sweetwater. I don't think it's really considered a microbrewery anymore, but when, when they put in their tasting room and when they put in sort of their experience, you see the same thing with Brooklyn Brewery and others. There, there's something to be said for that. People really enjoy interacting with a brand and, and knowing that there's sort of some level of control from start to finish and that things are being you know, serve to them exactly how they're supposed to be, or you can look at a lot of different models there. And I think with the Apple model, there was two things there. Obviously, one, there's, you know, we know from uh, their leadership, right, uh, that there's obviously a massive level of anal retentive control on the way that the products are not only positioned, the customers are educated everything from, you know, the, 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 uh, the geniuses that the genius bar and everything else, but also perception. Right, the, the perception, the perceived quality of the products, the way in which they are ultimately merchandised and presented and the exclusivity, especially early on of where you could or could not get those products, I think was a big part of that, that strategy. And that was a main differentiator between someone like Apple and Samsung. Apple invested in the brand temple, Samsung really didn't. And I, you know, proof is in the pudding, right? It could have gone either way, but obviously it went incredibly well for Apple. And so I think for, for us, you know, the larger, vertically integrated MSOs that are building national brands and are really investing in all of these products. I think that in, I think for the next five years, you probably see a, a consistent model to what we see today. At least that, that's, that's my take on it. The incredibly cool conversations, panels, and speeches go on and on 150 hours available now at cannabisbusinesssummit.com. I definitely can't not mention our day one keynote who joined us to talk about the intersection of cannabis, art, and culture, Carlos Santana. The legendary Grammy award-winning musician spoke for an hour on spirituality, healing, and his love for the plant. I almost wish the next clip was the whole thing. It's all so good.
Can talk a little bit about uh, Carlos. You mentioned, um, you know, in, indigenous tribes using cannabis, and and um, I know that uh, bringing the Latinx community into into the fold is an important part of this this brand. And maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the efforts that you're making right now to to incorporate the Latinx community. Naturally, for me, bring it, being who I am, um, I bring it all with me, like Bob Marley. You know, some people come in and everything comes with them. Apache, Puerto Rican, Irish, German, Palestine, Hebrew, you know, it all comes together and, and it, stop, it stops being a conflict. It, it becomes, hmm, hmm, you know, and all of a sudden, because when, when you're dancing, like a, like a dog shakes water, you know, you shake off fear, which is the opposite of un un unity and harmony. Uh, the Latino community, uh, you know, it changes so many names, uh, I think because that word was given by Hollywood, like the Latin lovers, like Cesar Romero and Ricardo Montalban and Anthony Quinn and, you know, all that. But I never really pay attention to any of that. You know, I am, I am an individual who is, somehow I never bought into any of that. Uh, I am a multidimensional spirit that can go anywhere and do anything that God wants me to do. Uh, and usually what God wants me to do is just to elevate consciousness and help people recognize their own superpowers to create miracles and blessings. You and I, we have the same quotient of light in every molecule that you have and I have. So therefore we can use imagination, aspiration, tenacity in a, in a positive way and we can achieve, again, miracles and blessings. That's what we talk a little bit about. So what Santana song is now stuck in your head? Mine is smooth. Comment yours wherever you're watching NCIA today this week. The summit is available in its entirety for one more week. So don't miss it. Switching gears to politics. For an in-depth look at the results of the U.S. election earlier this month, NCIA has tons of resources to keep you informed and inspired. Tune into a recent podcast with NCIA's Director of Public Policy, Andrew Klein, and NCIA's, NCIA's CEO and co-founder, Aaron Smith, as we talk about key congressional races, state ballot initiatives, and predictions about how our next White House administration will look at cannabis policy reform. NCIA's Policy Council also recently published our latest policy white paper titled Environmental Sustainability in the Cannabis Industry, which includes best business practices and policy recommendations. Special thanks to the whole team who contributed to this robust publication, which you can download in the Industry Reports section of NCIA's website. Before we wrap up this episode, here's a few reminders. We're doing a great job staying home, wearing masks, and socially distancing through these difficult times. We can't wait to get back to hosting our national and regional events in person later in 2021. In the meantime, make sure you're subscribed to our email list and listening to NCIA's weekly podcasts hosted by myself and Tahir Johnson. And now is a great time to invest in the future of our industry by getting more involved in NCIA, registering for our educational webinars, and learning more about our diversity, equity, and inclusion program sponsorship opportunities. Join NCIA members who have stepped up their support by becoming DEI program sponsors like Forefront Ventures and Greenbridge Corporate Council. In the meantime, our full-time government relations team in D.C. is pressing on with our cannabis policy reform efforts in Congress, ending federal marijuana prohibition, and opening opportunities for the legal industry. The unexpected disruption to our 2020 events program that I mentioned earlier has a serious financial impact on NCIA's operations. Please make sure that your cannabis business is a member of NCIA or consider making a donation to NCIA during this difficult time. If you're not following our social media channels on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, 
check out all the great content and inspiration we're sharing. If you're a member of NCIA, we encourage you to check out your new member benefit, NCIA Connect, and dive right into the conversation today. We'll see you soon.